so excited for Phil and Sylvia going on a cruise of the Rhone River starting tomorrow, leaving tomorrow morning, flying out of Charlotte. And um, Phil is a sailor for love of sailing, aren't you, Phil? I know that Phil has a, a love for getting out on a lake with a catamaran. And several years ago, Maureen and I were out with another couple down on Lake Hartwell down in Georgia when we were pastoring down in in uh, Athens and Madison, Georgia. And um, this gentleman that we were out with was an expert sailor. He was a captain and been out on the ocean and done all kinds of sailing. And we had a catamaran um, out there on Lake Hartwell. And uh, we were just having a grand time, just this guy and myself, just sailing along. And we were up on one pontoon and we were really having a wonderful time. And all of a sudden, in the middle of this great afternoon sailing, a storm blew in. And it blew in really quickly, very sharp, very fast, very severe. Dark clouds rolled in, thunder and lightning, and we weren't anywhere near shore. It just blew in, and that's great wind, Phil. It's really wonderful to be out there when it's really blowing like that. The lightning, all of that's pretty dangerous. So we started trying to sail in to the shore, to get to the shore as quickly as we could, to get off of the catamaran, to get away from that. You know, it's like a lightning rod sticking up in the middle of the lake. So we were just going as fast as we could to the shore, but we were having fun doing it. And we got way up on one pontoon, and that, mm, it just, we just went too far. And we ended up completely upside down, massed straight down in the lake, turtled totally, Turtled totally in the middle of Lake Hartwell, in the middle of this thunderstorm, lightning, all of that. Uh, I was scared to death, laughing to beat the band. It was so scary and so much fun to be out there. You know what you do when you have a Hobie cat upside down, turtled with the mass straight down in a lake? What you do is you, you swim down and you grab the rope on one of those pontoons, and then you get up and you take this rope in your hand and you just stand there and lean. You just lean. And minutes go by, and minutes go by, and minutes go by, and you don't think you're doing anything at all, and pretty soon you feel a little motion. And more minutes go by, and pretty soon you feel that boat coming, and it just pops right back up. We got that sail back up. We got to the shore. We got off the shore, over into a shelter. Very safe. Can you imagine what it would have been like that night when Jesus, in Mark chapter 4, Mark chapter 4 took his disciples, the 12 apostles, and other, in other boats out on the Sea of Galilee, sailing at night in the midst of a storm. If I could ask one question to Mark this morning, I would ask this. What does God think of self-reliance? What does God think of self-reliance? What is God's point of view when we depend on our own abilities our own skills, our own knowledge, our own systems, our own organizations, our own theologies. What does God think when we rely on self? What does God do when we go it alone? Jesus once had a conflict with the scribes and the Pharisees. And if you just turn to Mark chapter 4, we'll get there in just a moment. Jesus had a conflict with the scribes and the Pharisees, and they were seeking a sign from him. The master responded clearly and unequivocally, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, and no sign shall be given it except, except. He had just cast out a demon from a blind mute man, he had healed this man in the presence of the Pharisees, and the Pharisees had responded by saying, this man casts out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons. These people were attributing to the devil the work of God. Now, sometimes I can understand people attributing to God the work of the devil misunderstanding God, but when you see good taking place, when you see goodness, and you attribute that to Beelzebul, the prince of demons, 
You know, sometimes a storm passes through, and we actually call that an act of God. Now, I don't believe it's an act of God, but I understand it. Because what God allows, what God permits, sometimes he's depicted in the Bible as actually doing, hardening Pharaoh's heart. But when you see the goodness of God being done, and you attribute that to the devil, look out. The Pharisees said, this man casts out demons by Beelzebul, the ruler of demons. When they sought for some other additional verification of his ministry, Jesus refused to give it. And it was in that context, in Matthew chapter 12, and only in Matthew chapter 12, that Jesus told this parable. He said, now when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places seeking rest and does not find it there. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house unoccupied, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and takes along with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself. And they go in and live there. And the last state of that man is worse than than the first. Then Jesus said, that is the way it will be with this generation. Many lessons can be learned from that parable. First, Jesus was not speaking of an individual primarily, but of an evil generation. The generation that was attributing to Beelzebul the very things that God was doing. Beware, my friends, of calling something devilish when it's actually God moving. Are you so blind that you would call something evil that is actually good? Jesus was not just speaking of an individual here, but of an evil generation. The generation that was attributing the beautiful work of God to our enemy. The primary application of this parable is a corporate application. And the house that is mentioned there, that is swept, put in order, ordered, and neat. That was the house of Israel. Also, Jesus was emphasizing in this corporate sense that it is not enough to be rid of evil influences. You must also be full of something. You cannot just be empty. You can't be on a fence, friends. You cannot just be empty. You will always be full of something. The house in this parable was swept, put in order, organized, neat, orderly, but unoccupied. So when the demon found it unoccupied, he brought seven other demons, seven being symbolic of complete, total filling. Seven other demons, even worse than he. And the last state of the house was worse than the first. We will all be full of something. But Jesus also slipped into this parable a subtle teaching, a teaching that was common to the Jewish people, but we have lost sight of it today. The Jews during his day, the Pharisees that he was talking to, understood this. But we sometimes do not. Jesus said that when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places seeking rest and finds none. Demons pass through waterless places seeking rest but they cannot find rest in waterless places. They need water. Jesus is speaking symbolically here, friends. The unclean spirit passes through waterless places and finds no rest there, no shalom. In other words, the unclean spirit is seeking water. In the Jewish mind, the seas were the habitations of demons. As we do today, the Hebrews called the seas the deep or the abyss. We sometimes make movies like that. The deep, the abyss. And they're always places of suspense, 
evil, harboring terrible things, unknown things, fear. This sprang from the very beginning of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. The earth without form and void, the Spirit of God moves on the face of the deep. When the deep is mentioned in creation, the earth is formless and void, and darkness, darkness was on the face of the deep. For the Pharisees, stormy seas, a storm, a stormy, deep, tempest-tossed, place full of water was the place of the habitation of demons. No story in the Bible illustrates this more than the story of Jonah. The prophet Jonah received a commission from God. God said, I want you to go to Nineveh, the capital city of the Assyrians, and I want you to speak for me there, cry out to the city of Nineveh. And Jonah immediately bailed on his commissioning Nineveh was a landlocked city in a dry place. And it was equidistant between the Caspian Sea, the Persian Gulf, and the Mediterranean Sea. Right in the middle of it. And Jonah was told to go there. But Jonah decides that instead of going to Nineveh, he's going to go to Tarshish. On the western coast of Spain. On the Atlantic Ocean through the Gibraltar Strait, as far as possibly could be gotten away from Nineveh, Jonah was going to go. So he rushes down to Joppa. He purchases his ticket. He gets in the boat. He goes down into the hold of the boat and falls asleep. They put out to sea. And I love the way the text reads here. It actually says that the Lord God hurled a great wind on the sea. And there was a great storm on the sea so that the ship was about to break up. The Lord God hurled this storm onto the sea. And the sailors became afraid and every man cried to his God because they just knew that the seas were the habitations of demonic forces. Gods and goddesses played there and caused They wreaked havoc on the seas. Jonah had gone into the hold of the ship, lain down, fallen asleep. But these sailors were struggling against the wind and the rain. And the sailors became afraid and every man cried to his God. Every man cried to his God. Every man but Jonah. Jonah had gone into the hold of the ship, lain down, fallen asleep. So the captain approached him and said, How is it that you're sleeping? Don't you see this storm raging around us? Get up. Call on your God. Perhaps your God will be the one who will be concerned for us. The crew cast lots at that point on account of this storm. And the lot fell on Jonah When the sea became increasingly stormy, Jonah said to them, Pick me up, throw me into the sea. And the sailors did not want to do this. But they rowed more desperately to return to the land. And the storm increased and God kept hurling the wind against them. And so finally, in the end, (coughs) they picked Jonah up and threw him into the sea. And the sea stopped its raging, the text says. Then the men were in the deep. They feared God greatly. And they offered sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. For three days, Jonah was in the great abyss, in the deep. For three days, Jonah sank to the depths of the sea. For the ancient peoples, the sea was a powerful symbol. A stormy sea was a place where the forces of evil played. Thunder and lightning, wind and wave. These elements serve to call men's minds back to their gods or to the true God. So we come to this passage in Mark chapter 4, the very end of the chapter, verse 35 and following. The disciples had such poetic imagery blowing in their minds when Jesus one day commanded them that they were going to go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. On that day when evening came, Jesus said to them, Let us go to the other side, to the other side. 
leaving the crowd, they took him along with them in the boat just as he was, and other boats were with him. And there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat, so much that the boat was already filling up. Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he got up, and he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, be still. And the wind died down, and it became perfectly calm. He said to them, why are you afraid? Do you have no faith? And they became very much afraid and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? On that day when evening came, when the sun was going down, Jesus, who had been ministering in Capernaum for some time, who had been laboring in Capernaum, said, we're going to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. He had been healing the sick in Capernaum. He, in Mark chapter 4, had been doing his only teaching in the Galilean ministry in Mark. He had told this series of agricultural parables, unpacking how the Jewish people were to reach the Gentile world. And, And Mark Jesus is teaching, he's preaching, he's healing, he's caring for people. And all of a sudden, at the end of the day, he says, let's go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Let's go away from Jewish territory and go to that area over by the Decapolis. The region of the Decapolis, the territory of the Gerasenes. Let's go over there. Leaving the crowd, he took took the disciples in the boat And this great storm of wind and waves rose up and broke over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. You know, the Sea of Galilee sits in the northern area of of the Palestinian Rift, of the the Jordan Rift. And the Sea of Galilee is like what we would call around here a big lake. It's not really that much of a sea if you get right down to it. You can see across it. It's easy. Um, I actually saw when I was there back in 1999, Phil, I saw people out there water skiing on the Sea of Galilee. Imagine that. But the Sea of Galilee sits there in these, among these hills. But what is interesting is that just south of the Sea of Galilee, stretching from the very bottom of the Sea of Galilee, northwestward toward the Mediterranean Sea, is a valley called the Jezreel Valley. And the Jezreel Valley is an open rift in the mountains stretching from the Mediterranean all the way down to the bottom of the Sea of Galilee, the southernmost portion. So when fronts pass from west to east, when they come off the Mediterranean Sea, there is no place for those storms to go with the Judean mountains right there along the Mediterranean Sea, except... For this Jezreel Valley, this Jezreel Rift. So oftentimes, even today, storms will blow in off the Mediterranean Sea. And the Jezreel Valley actually functions as a funnel. And all of this wind comes off the Mediterranean and blows down the Jezreel Valley. And comes to this Transjordan Plateau and can go no farther. So it swings up onto the Sea of Galilee, sort of like a little hurricane, a little tornado. So Jesus and his disciples are out on the Sea of Galilee in the middle of the night when one of these Jezreel Valley storms blows down the valley and besets their boat. The wind and the waves rise up. There's strife, turmoil, conflict. And Jesus, what was he doing? He was just like Jonah. He was in the stern of the boat Asleep. They've actually unearthed one of these boats some years ago when there was a drought. The Sea of Galilee went down and they found in the Sea of Galilee a boat from the time of Jesus. They call it the Jesus boat. And in the stern there's a decking. And you can crawl up under that decking in the stern and be safe from wind and wave and rain and storm. And I can just see Jesus getting in the boat after all this ministry. He is worn out. He's tired from healing people, teaching people. Caring for people, he's just, he's just spent. And he says, let's go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And when he gets in the boat, he crawls up into the stern of that boat and lies down and falls asleep. And this wind and wave arises and the disciples come and say, Master, do you not care that we're perishing? We're about to drown here. 
And then Jesus gets up and calms the wind and the rain and says, peace, be still. And it's perfectly calm. He said to them, why are you afraid? Don't you have faith? And then they became afraid for sure. Who is this then that even the wind and the sea obey him? Who is this? Who commands the wind and the sea and they obey? Who can make stormy seas calm? I know that your lives are full of storm. Wind and waves are blowing against you. I know you have conflict in your lives. I know you do. Because we're in the Sea of Galilee in this world. But do we have Christ in the boat or not? How long we will, will we continue to rely on ourselves and to struggle against the wind and the waves when the master is in your life? I don't know what struggle you're facing today. I don't know what hardship you're going through. I just know that you're going through one. You may be having financial hardship. You may be having familial trouble. Some of you may be having trouble in your marriages. Some of you may be struggling with all kinds of addictions. I don't know what you're struggling with. But do you have Christ in your life or not? How does Jesus relate to self-reliance? You know what I think? I think he's bored. I think he crawls up into the stern of your life and falls asleep. He's not going to force himself into your life when you don't want him in your life. Jesus is not omnipotent. God can't just do anything. He cannot lie. He cannot cheat. He cannot use the methods of the devil in the battle against the devil. And he cannot go where he is not wanted. It's the rule of his character. It's the rule of love. And if you don't want Jesus awake taking care of the storms of your life. He'll let that storm play out. But if you want. If you will turn to him. And say, Master, I've struggled against this all I can. I've done everything I can. And the storm's still too big for me. Master, can you help? He's ready. The first step is you're not God. And you can't fix the problems in your life. You have to turn to Christ. And He's ready to still the storm. Now... Lest you think that I'm saying that if you will just turn to God and pray to the Lord Jesus that all the storms in your life are going to go away. I'm not saying that. Sometimes he calls the storm. Sometimes he calms the storm. But sometimes he calms you. Sometimes he brings peace to the circumstances of your life. But in every case he can bring peace to you. How often, how often are we going to continue to struggle and fight and strive and by force of human will try to overcome this world when the one who has overcome the world is asleep in our lives? All he wants is for you to turn to him and say, Master, Master, how do I know this? You know, folks, some of you, some of you here may not even be able to crawl out, Master. Some of you may be so burdened down by addiction or by trial or by heavy hearts or circumstance or depression. Some of you may be so weighted down that you can't even get the words out, Master. 
But recognize this, immediately when Jesus calms the storm on the Sea of Galilee, immediately they're at the land and what happens then? This demoniac comes out from among the tombs and is screaming out to Jesus, what do we have to do with you? Get out of here, you're the Holy One of Israel. He doesn't even cry out. And Jesus casts the demons out of that demoniac and gives him a peaceful life. He calms that demoniac. The demoniac's problems probably didn't go away. He may have still had financial problems and familial problems and all kinds of problems, but his life was calm and he was sitting and clothed in his right mind. By the way, what happened to the demons in that situation? They went into these swine and where did the swine go? They rushed down the hillside back into the sea where they belong because that's the place, the deep, the abyss, that's the place where the demons belong. So right there, we are given an example of God, how he can calm the stormy seas in a person's life. If he can do that with a person who is possessed by demons, then surely he can do it for you. How long will you strive against God? How long will you try to do this on your own? God is not a fan of your self-reliance. He wants to be involved with your life. Why don't you turn to him? You know, in the Gospel of Mark, interestingly enough, um, there are two stories of the stilling of the seas. Today we've looked at one where Jesus is traveling from Jewish territory, Jewish territory to Gentile territory, and he's in the boat. And next week, we're going to look at a story where Jesus is actually walking on water. And when you see these two stories juxtaposed against one another, you begin to get a snapshot of what Jesus Mark is trying to do what he's trying to teach in his gospel. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful. We are so grateful that uh, sometimes you calm the storms, but other times you calm the child. And we are so grateful that you are willing and ready and stand able to wake up in our lives if we'll just turn to you. We here in this sanctuary today, all of us here in this sanctuary, have come here of our own free will. And that says something good. That says something good. That we all in this sanctuary have you in our lives. But for some of us, we continue to strive and be self-reliant when what you really want is to be awake in our lives and handling our lives with us. Only you can calm the stormy seas of our lives. So Lord, today I believe that there's a person here who might actually want to wake up to you. And I just pray, Lord, that you'd move on that heart right now. Draw us close to you, O Lord, I pray for Jesus' sake. Amen.